So in this video, we're going to look at another text to go alongside the Virgil Aeneid Book 2. Uh, and this is a poem from Ovid's Heroides. Uh, Heroides is a collection of poems, and the title uh, translates into English as Heroines. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, what actually is this collection of poems? Well, it was written by this poet called Ovid. Uh, his actual name was Publius Ovidius Naso, and we call him Ovid in English. He wrote this collection of poems in the 10s BC. So if you remember, Virgil died with his Aeneid unfinished, but mostly finished, in the year 19 BC. So Ovid is writing this just after Virgil's death. And that's quite important because, in many ways, the poem uh, that we're going to read here is entirely a response to Virgil's Aeneid. It's a kind of different take on a story from Virgil's Aeneid. <clears throat> and basically, all of the Herodes are poems that are written as letters from mythological women to absent husbands or lovers. So Greek myth is full of uh, women who get abandoned by heroes, by, by men, and Ovid is imagining, you know, what would these women say to those men if they were given a voice? So that's what he's doing. Um, the one that we're looking at here is Poem 7, and it's a letter <clears throat> um, written as if from Dido to Aeneas after he abandons her. Uh, now, you may remember a bit of this Dido and Aeneas story from GCSE, but it's just worth recapping uh, what has happened. So the context is Dido, as a character, was uh, originally a princess of Tyre. She was born as a princess of Tyre, which is um, uh, to the east um, of, of Carthage, where she ends up. Um, it is what is now Lebanon. Um, her brother, though, um, ends up uh, murdering her husband, Sikius, uh, for money, basically. Um, and that uh, that's the king, by the way. Her brother is the king. He murders her husband, Sikius. Um, she has to flee from Tyre. And she takes with her a band of refugees, kind of fleeing this evil king, Pygmalion. Um, and they end up in North Africa. They found a new city called Carthage. Um, later on, and this is the story told in Virgil's Aeneid, um, the Trojan hero Aeneas washes up there, right? He's making his journey gradually from Troy, eventually to Italy. And among various adventures, he washes up in Carthage. He is welcomed by uh, Dido and the other Carthaginians, but they want to know who he is and so on, so he tells his story. Um, and that's where book two of the Aeneid comes in, right? Book two of the Aeneid is Aeneas telling his story and the story of the fall of Troy to Dido and the Carthaginians. Um, after that, um, Aeneas and Dido fall in love. And the idea is um, that they basically start to share the rule of Carthage. So they become a kind of king and queen, if you like, of Carthage. The problem is that Aeneas's fate is not to rule Carthage. His fate is to go to Italy um, and found a new kind of civilization, which will eventually become the Roman civilization. So if you remember in Aeneid Book 2, you get Creusa, uh, Aeneas's first wife, giving this speech about, um, you know, about how Aeneas will go to Italy and found a new civilization, etc. Um, so Aeneas has to leave Carthage. Dido is utterly devastated by this. Um, and she's so devastated about her abandonment that she uh, commits suicide. Uh, so this is now in Aeneid Book 4. Um, and Virgil, in his treatment of this story, is pretty sympathetic to Aeneas, um, 
you know, he doesn't present Aeneas as a villain here. He presents Aeneas as someone who is simply following the commands of the gods and, you know, doing what he's told, even though it's very difficult, going on to Italy. Um, Ovid is giving us the other version, right? Ovid is giving us Dido's version and saying, well, what would Aeneas look like from Dido's point of view? And the answer is basically a villain. So that's what we're going to see. Um, the poem begins, um, Dido to Aeneas, uh, just telling us who is writing the letter. And then it begins like this, Trojan, receive this song of dying Dido. What you read are the last words written by me. So when she says Trojan, that refers, of course, to Aeneas. She then says, at fate's call, the white swan, despondent on the grass, sings like this to the waters of Meander. I do not speak because I hope to move you with prayers. I offer up my prayers to a hostile god. But since I may have wholly wasted my reputation for merit and for chaste body and spirit, the waste of words is nothing. So first of all, why is Dido suddenly talking about a swan? Well, the answer is there was a famous legend that um, swans are mute. They have no voice until they sing one beautiful song just before death. Um, that's where the phrase swan song comes from in English. So by comparing herself to the swan singing, Dido is pointing out that she is about to kill herself. Um, and she says, you know, she says, I'm not hoping to change your mind, Aeneas. She says, I'm offering up prayers to a hostile god, right? And that's Aeneas. She's referring to Aeneas as a hostile god. She says, I know that you're nasty. You don't like me anymore. Um, I know that I'm wasting my words, but I don't care. I'm going to say it anyway. And she says, you know, I've already wasted my reputation for merit. Um, the idea here is that Dido had promised um, after the after her first husband, Zacchaeus, was killed by her brother back in Tyre, she promised that she would not remarry. She would remain faithful to the memory of Zacchaeus. Now, she has broken that vow by falling in love with Aeneas. So she says, you know, I've already lost my reputation. I've broken my vow um, to my dead husband, Zacchaeus. So in a sense, you know, I've already, you know, that is such a terrible thing that you, what does it matter if I now waste some words, you know, begging this man, Aeneas, who's not going to change his mind. She then says, you're still determined to go, abandon, abandoning wretched Dido, and the same wind will carry off your sails and promises. Aeneas, you're determined to break your pledge, loose your ships, to seek domains in Italy. Where? You do not know. You're not moved by new Carthage, its growing walls, or the supreme power entrusted to you by the scepter. You flee what's done, you seek what is to do. Yet searching another kingdom in the world, it's already found. So the point is, you know, she's saying to Aeneas, look, you've made a pledge to me, right? You're determined to break your pledge. But she says, what for? She says, you know, to seek domains in Italy. Where? You know, you don't even know where you're going. What's the point? You know, you've got this wonderful new city here, Carthage, which is full of, you know, potential. It's growing walls and so on. Um, she's given him supreme power. You know, she's sharing the rule of Carthage um, with him. And yet he's running off for this adventure that he doesn't even know um, anything about. He doesn't know where he's going and so on. Um so she's saying this is a crazy thing for him to do. She says, if you reach that country, who'd surrender it to you? Who'd give possession of his fields to an unknown? Another love's in store for you, another dido and another pledge being given, which you'll again deceive. Where might you create a city as good as Carthage and look out on your people from its high fortress? If it all came to pass and the gods did not delay your hopes, where would you find a, a wife to love you like this. Um, so Dido here is saying, well, okay, let's imagine you go to Italy. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think someone's just going to hand over their land to you? No. So, you know, she says this is, again, it's a crazy idea. Who would just give their fields to someone they've never met? Um, and then she says, okay, you're going to fall in love again with someone else. Um, this is uh, a reference to the fact that Aeneas will marry again. He will marry an Italian woman called Lavinia. 
who is also mentioned by Creusa in Aeneid Book 2. Um, but Dido says, you know, you'll deceive her as well, just like you deceived me. Um, and she says, you know, you'll never find a wife to love you like I do. You'll never find a city as good as this city of Carthage is, etc. Now, notice this is a totally different version of Aeneas from what we have in Virgil's Aeneid. Virgil's Aeneas is characterized by what is called pietas, you know, a sense of duty. Aeneas in Virgil constantly feels duty. He feels duty to Creusa his first wife, he feels duty to his father Anchises, he feels duty to, you know, the Trojan people who he has to save, or at least save as many of them as he can, you know, he feels duty to the gods, which is why he rescues the statues of the gods of Troy, um, you know, whereas in, um, in Ovid here, Aeneas is the opposite of dutiful, right, he is a betrayer, uh, he is someone who betrays Dido and who Dido imagines will betray his next wife as well. She says, I'm scorched like wax torches dipped in sulphur, like holy incense added to smoking pyres. My sleepless eyes cling always to Aeneas. I have Aeneas in my mind day and night. It's true that he's ungrateful and silent about my gifts, and if I weren't a fool, I'd wish to be free. Yet I don't hate Aeneas, though he might think badly of me, though I complain of his treachery, still I love him more. So Dido is experiencing this kind of burning pain of rejected love, right? She feels like a wax torch dipped in sulphur, uh, like incense added to smoking pyres. Now pyres are those piles of wood that you put a dead body on to burn. So all of this imagery suggests that she's about to commit suicide. And we can see how confused her feelings are. You know, she says, if I were not a fool, I would wish to be free. In other words, if I were not a fool, I would just hate Aeneas and move on. But the problem is she cannot move on. She still is in love with Aeneas. Then she says, Venus, spare your daughter-in-law, and Cupid, embrace your hard-hearted brother. Let him serve in your ranks. So I, who began this love, I don't scorn indeed to say this, might offer him the substance of my affections. So Venus, we have to remember, Venus, the goddess of love, is the mother of Aeneas. So therefore, you know, Dido believes that she and Aeneas are married, although the marriage ceremony was a bit um, confused and, you know, Aeneas doesn't think they're properly married. But anyway, Dido sees them as married. So therefore, if Aeneas is Venus's son, then Dido must be Venus's um, daughter-in-law. So that explains uh, the phrasing here. Um, similarly, Cupid, the god, um, he is, um, you know, the, the little chubby baby with the bow and arrows. He is the son of Venus, so therefore that's why he is Aeneas's brother, because they are both sons of Venus. And so basically Dido is saying, you know, she's asking, um, she's asking um, the gods, Venus and Cupid, as the gods of love, to kind of make Aeneas love her again. Um... And, and then she is willing um, to take him back, is the point. Um, and again, there's a desperation here, right? We, you know, this isn't going to happen because fate dictates otherwise, right? Aeneas's fate is to go onwards to Italy. So this prayer is not going to be answered. Uh, the prayer to basically keep Aeneas uh, in Carthage. She then says, I'm cheated. And this is a false idea I speak of. He differs from his mother in disposition, begotten by stones or hills or native oaks on tall cliffs, by savage beasts or by the sea, such as you now gaze on, stirred by the winds. Why do you still prepare to battle with adverse tides? Where do you flee to? Storms obstruct you. The storm's aid will benefit me. See how the wind excites the crashing waves. The storms I wished for you comes to pass without me. Wind and wave are more just to me than your heart. Um, so here, at the beginning, he uh, Dido says that Aeneas must be begotten by stones or hills or oaks. 
uh, or beasts or something. And the point is that, you know, Aeneas has told her that he is the son of Venus, right? But Venus is the god of love. So Dido is saying, you know, if you were really the son of the love goddess, you would be loving. You would be a loving person, and you're not. So she says that must be a lie, right? That story that you're the son of Venus must be a lie. You must instead be the son of something really hard and harsh and unyielding, something like a stone or a hill or an oak tree. Um, now, I don't think Dido means this literally, right? She doesn't literally think Aeneas is the son of a stone, but she's kind of speaking metaphorically here. You know, Aeneas is more similar to a, to a tough stone or tree um, than he is to Venus because he's so cold and, and lacking in, in, in feeling and sympathy. Um, and she says, you know, why do you still prepare to battle with adverse tides? In other words, there's a storm happening, you know, so don't go, you know, just stay, um, stay here. And, um, and she says... Um, you know, she says, the storm's aid will benefit me. And I think, um, I think she's kind of suggesting that it might keep her there. Uh, sorry, it might keep Aeneas there. The storm will keep Aeneas stuck in Carthage. Um, and she says also, uh, you know, at the end there, she says, wind and wave are more just to me than your heart. In other words, Aeneas is so unfair, he's so cruel and so on, that he's actually, he has less of a sense of justice than the winds and the waves have. Okay, um, so then she says, I'm not worth so much that you should perish unjustly by not being stopped from fleeing me over the wide seas. You'd be cultivating constancy and hatred too lavishly if, though free of me, you met a common fate. Soon the winds will die and evenly over the level waves. Triton will drive his dark green horses through the waters." So I think Dido's just having a moment of self-doubt here where she says, you know, I'm not worth so much that you should perish. So in other words, she she's almost recognising that Aeneas has this important fate and that she is kind of unworthy. She's not, you know, she's almost irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. Um, and um, so I think that's that's her, her point here. And... Um, and she's pointing out that soon the storms will die down and Aeneas probably will be able to make his journey. So she's kind of almost acknowledging that her prayers are not going to be answered, I think. Um, then she says, I wish that you too might be altered like the winds. And you will unless you're harder than an oak. Or you will unless you're harder than an oak. Why, unless you're ignorant of how furious the seas can be, do you often so wrongly trust the water you've, waters you've tried? Even when you loose the hawsers, persuaded by the tide, still the wide sea holds many sorrows. So this is still the same point. You know, why are you trying to sail on the sea when it's so dangerous? Um, and she says, um, you know, why do you so often trust the waters? Because, of course, it was a storm that shipwrecked Aeneas in Carthage in the first place. He was never intending to come to Carthage. So she's saying, look, you've already been shipwrecked once. Why are you going out to sea again when it's dangerous? So the whole point here is her saying, stay here, don't go. Uh, stay here in Carthage where it's safe rather than a dangerous journey uh, on the sea. She then says, it's no use tempting the waves when faith's been violated. There's punishments demanded for treachery. There, punishments demanded for treachery, especially when love is wounded. Because Venus, it said, the mother of Cupid, was born naked from Kythera's waters. Okay, the logic here is a little bit confusing. But what we need to understand is the myth um, about Venus's birth, right? The, the myth is that Venus was born from the sea, right? And if you look in this uh, picture here, right, this is a famous painting by Botticelli, which depicts the birth of Venus from the sea. So the idea is, okay, if Venus is born from the sea, the sea is in some sense her domain. She has some kind of power over the sea. And therefore, if someone 
has betrayed love, which is her other domain, enters the sea, then she is going to have the power to punish them, right? There is this ancient idea that, you know, gods can only really punish mortals within their own sphere of activity. So the fact that Aeneas, sorry, the fact that Venus was born from the sea makes the sea her sphere of activity. And so someone who has betrayed love, which is her other sphere of activity, and then entered the sea, is a prime target for punishment by Venus. That's the, the argument. Um, so she's saying, in other words, you know, since Venus was born in the sea, you are taking a big risk. You, Aeneas, are taking a big risk if you enter the sea. Okay, then she says, lost, I fear lest I lose and harm the one who harmed, lest my enemy, shipwrecked, drink the salt breakers. Live, I beg you. Thus I'd curse you more harshly than if you died. You'd be more widely known as the cause of my death. Come, imagine, if you were snatched up by a swift whirlwind. Let there be no weight to that omen. What would be in your mind? Um, so, I think here we again see Dido's mixed emotions because she says I fear she says I am lost right she's entirely in a mess but she says I fear lest I lose in other words she doesn't want to lose Aeneas which is strange because in a sense she's already lost him and you know even though she's lost him as a husband she still doesn't want him to die and likewise she says I don't want to harm the one who harmed so in other words Aeneas has betrayed her but yet she still doesn't want to do him any harm, even through her prayers. Um, and she then says uh, later on here, she says, imagine if you were snatched up, snatched up by a swift whirlwind, what would be in your mind? So she says, okay, she says, I don't want you to be caught up in a storm, right? She says, let there be no weight to that omen, right? Let that not happen. But she says, if you were caught up in a storm, what would be in your mind? So she, she wants, she's trying to imagine, you know, if Aeneas was in a storm and was on the point of dying, perhaps, what would he be thinking about? And then she says, immediately, the perjury of your false tongue will strike you and Dido, forced to die by Trojan deceit. The image of the wife you cheated would stand before your eyes in sorrow and with loosened blood-stained hair. However many times you say, forgive me, I deserved it all, you'll find each one a thunderbolt falling on you. So, so Dido is imagining, you know, what would Aeneas be thinking in his final moments? And she imagines that he would almost he would see a kind of hallucination almost of Dido in front of him. And he would have a kind of deathbed conversion, if you like. He would suddenly repent on his deathbed. And he would say, oh, you know, I, I now realise that I was in the wrong. Um, and he would find each, you know, each time he says this, he would find it like a thunderbolt falling on him. In other words, it would be so painful to suddenly realise that he was in the wrong. Um, now, of course, all of this is fantasy from Dido because, um, first of all, Aeneas doesn't die in a shipwreck. Um, <clears throat> you know, as we know, he goes on to Italy to found what will become Roman civilization. Um, but also, we don't know whether um, Aeneas feels this kind of guilt. Right? She wants him to feel this guilt, but who knows whether he does or not. Um, okay, she then says, grant a little space to your cruelty and the sea. A safe path in future will be the great reward for your delay. If you've no care for me, spare your child, Eulus. It's enough for you to bear notoriety for my death. Why do that son, Eulus, and your household gods deserve this? Shall the waves bury those gods you rescued from the fire? So, um, when Dido says, grant a little space to your cruelty in the sea, a safe path in future will be the great reward for your delay. She's saying, basically, just wait a bit. You know, don't go yet. Wait for the storms to calm down. And she's talking about two types of storms. One is the sea, so the literal storms, and the other is his cruelty. So she's basically saying, you know, if you just wait a bit, first of all, you will calm down. Um, 
and realize that you're better off here. And second of all, the sea will calm down. Um, so she's it's it's kind of a bit confused what she's hoping for here. But it's the idea seems to be if you just wait a while, um, then if you do have to go, then at least the storms will have subsided. But hopefully, maybe um, Aeneas will have changed his mind about going at all. Um, and she tries to do a bit of, I guess, emotional manipulation here. So she says, okay, you don't want to stay for me. Fair enough. But she says, what about your child, Ulysses? Um, are you really going to risk his life sailing into a storm? And then she says, what about your household gods? Right, these are the, the um, little statuettes um, that Aeneas saved from the flames of Troy when Troy was being destroyed. And she says, you know, What's the point of, of bravely saving the statuettes of the Trojan Penates, the Trojan household gods, um, from the fire, only to then lose them at sea in a shipwreck? So again, the point is just stay a little while longer. Um, she then says, but you did not bring them with you, as you told me, traitor, nor did your sacred father straddle your shoulders. You lied about it all, for your lying tongue did not start with me, nor am I the first one to be punished. If you ask where Creusa is, the lovely mother of Eulis, she died alone, abandoned by a hard-hearted husband. You told me this, but in winning, you su in winning me, you suppressed it. From that minor fault came my future punishment." So again, we have to remember, in Virgil, Aeneas's defining characteristic is pietas, as you can see in this um, statue by Bernini, right? There is Aeneas um, on his father, he's carrying, uh, sorry, on his shoulders, he's carrying his father, Anchises. Um, he's also, his, you know, he's also carrying, or his father is carrying the Trojan gods, the little statues of the Trojan gods. And then uh, he's also leading his son, uh, Eulus behind him. So Aeneas is all about duty, right? The duty that he feels for his family, for his city, for his gods. Um, and Ovid is completely reversing all of that. Um, and Ovid is suggesting that maybe the whole story about Creusa is a lie. Okay, if you think back to Aeneas Book 2, the story is that Aeneas tried everything he could to save Creusa and he was unable to do so. But when you think about it, it's only Aeneas who would know what happened to Creusa. There was no one else with him at that point. Uh, you know, all, the whole scene in book two of the Aeneid when he's searching for Creusa, he is alone in that scene. So therefore, how do we know that that is what actually happened? So Ovid's suggestion is that in fact, Aeneas abandoned Creusa in a cruel way, and now is doing the same thing to Dido. And Dido is suggesting that, um, you know, she believed Aeneas' story about Creusa, but she was wrong to believe it. And Aeneas's behaviour here kind of demonstrates um, the kind of character he is, and that he must have been lying about the Creusa story as well. Um, she then says, I've no doubt that your gods condemn you. Storm-ridden for seven years by land and sea, spewed up by the waves, I received you to a safe harbour, and scarce having heard your name properly, gave you a kingdom. Yet I wish I'd been contented with those services, and my reputation not buried by our union. That day harmed me when a sudden dark rainstorm forced us to shelter under the roof of a cave. I heard a voice. I thought it the nymphs wailing. It was the Furies giving warning of my fate. So Dido is suddenly thinking, okay, you know, you Aeneas, you've been you've been kind of chased around the place by storms for seven years. So she's saying, huh, this must mean that you're a bad person because the gods are punishing you, right? So Aeneas, instead of being the victim of you know. Um, bad luck and so on with all these storms, suddenly an Ovid becomes a kind of villain who the gods are punishing for his bad behaviour. Um, and Dido is saying, look, I gave you so much. I let you, I, you, know, I let you in. Um, I barely knew who you were, and yet I fell in love with you and I allowed you to share my kingdom of Carthage. 
and so on. Um, and she says, I wish I'd just stopped there, right? I, I wish I'd been contented with those services. I wish I'd just, you know, helped you out and then sent you on your way. Um, and then she talks about the dark rainstorm. This is the story of their marriage, right? That they were out hunting one day. Um, there was a rainstorm. They sheltered in a cave. And that was where they did some sort of marriage ceremony, which Dido interprets as a marriage. Aeneas thinks it wasn't a proper marriage. But the point is, you know, Dido is just saying, I wish that had never happened. Um, and she says, you know, she heard this voice. She thought it was the sound of the nymphs kind of celebrating their marriage, but she now thinks it was actually the Furies, you know, these avenging goddesses who are kind of foretelling disaster. Um, okay, she then says, exact my punishment, wounded honour, and by the violated laws of my marriage bed, leave no reputation to my ashes. And you, ghost and spirit, and ashes of my Sikius, to whom, alas for me, filled with shame I go. Sikius is honoured by me in a marble shrine, covered by shadowing branches with their white strands of wool. Um, so she's basically saying, you know, she has been, you know, she's acted wrongly. She's betrayed her vow to remain faithful to Sikius. So she says, you know, exact my punishment. She's ready to be punished. Um, and her suicide will accomplish that. Um, she says, um, leave no reputation to my ashes. In other words, she's, again, she's broken her vow, so she doesn't deserve a good reputation after her death. Um, and she says that she is going to be with um, Sikius, right? Because Sikius is dead, so she's committing suicide, and she'll go and join him in the underworld. Um, and you know, again, I mean, she's been honouring, she's built a shrine to Sikius, but of course she feels like she's betrayed him anyway because of this um, relationship with Aeneas. She then says, from it, that's the shrine, from the shrine, four times I heard his familiar voice calling me by name, his tones faintly saying, Dido, come, no delay, I come, I come to you a wife in debt, yet still I am late through confessing to my shame. Grant forgiveness of my sin. He was worthy who deceived me, that it was him removes the evil from my offence. So she says that, you know, Sikius is calling to her to join him in the world of the dead. Um, and she says, yes, okay, I've, I've done bad things. Um, but she says that her offence, her betrayal of Sikius, was less bad because of the fact that Aeneas was such a great figure, right? The fact that he's a son of a goddess and so on kind of makes it okay that she fell in love with him. It's not entirely clear why. And it's also quite weird given that earlier on she was saying, you know, he isn't really Venus's son at all. And, you know, all his stories are lies and so on. So it kind of seems like Dido is very conflicted here. She doesn't really know what she believes. One minute she believes that Aeneas is making everything up. He isn't the son of Venus at all. Uh, his story is all lies. And now she's kind of saying, no, no, Aeneas is this great figure. He is the son of Venus. Uh, he is a great Trojan hero. And the fact that he is such a great figure makes it more understandable and excusable um, that she fell in love with him. So, you know, again, she's very conflicted and she's stating contradictory things depending on what argument she's trying to make at the time. She then says, his divine mother Venus and the son's pious burden, his old father Anchises, gave me hope he'd be a true husband to me. Um, so again, she's kind of excusing herself. She's kind of saying, well, the fact that he's the son of a goddess, um, the fact that he is a nice guy, you know, saving his old father from Troy, that kind of convinced her that he would be a good um, husband. She says, if I was mistaken, the error had an honest cause. Add my loyalty and nothing's to be regretted. The course of my fate holds true to the end and runs clear to the last day of my existence. My husband Sikius died at the altar of his house and my wicked brother Pygmalion has the spoils. Exiled from Tyre, I left my country, my husband's ashes and endured harsh journeys pursued by enemies. Um, so in this passage here, she's sort of saying, 
I think that, you know, she's had very bad luck, basically, throughout her life. Um, you know, her brother was evil, her husband was killed by the brother, she had to be a refugee fleeing from Tyre, and in a way, this final disaster and suicide is just a continuation of the kind of wretched life that she's had um, all the way through. Um, she then says, escaping my brother and the sea, I was brought to unknown lands and I won this shore that I granted to you, faithless man. Right, so that's Carthage. She says, I founded Carthage and laid out wide walls on every side, a cause of envy to the neighbouring peoples. War broke out, a stranger and a woman, they tested me by war, and I'd barely prepared the weapons and defences of my new city. I was flattered by a thousand suitors, begging to wed me, and I don't know which of their marriage beds I preferred. So Dido here is just going back over the story. You know, she escaped Pygmalion, she sailed across the sea, she founded Carthage, um, and as soon as she had founded it, a war broke out, right? Even though she was quite vulnerable, she's a stranger, she's a woman, nonetheless, the neighbouring peoples uh, attacked her at a time when she was barely just getting the city started. Um, and she was also struggling because there were all these men who wanted to marry her and she didn't know who to marry and it was all very difficult. So Dido is continuing this idea that her whole life has just been a series of problems and difficulties and disasters. You know, first of all, uh, the brother Pygmalion uh, being so evil, then the death, uh, the murder by Pygmalion of her husband, then having to flee from Tyre, you know, then her new city of Carthage being invaded and so on, then being plagued by suitors, um, uh, and then, of course, finally the betrayal by Aeneas. Um, the poem does go on a bit from there, um, and if you want to um, read a bit of the rest of it, um, then you can find it online, but that is um, the end of the section um, that's uh, set for the exam. And I think um, the main thing to take away from it when you read back over the poem is to think about how the depiction of Aeneas is different here compared to in Virgil. So in Virgil, we're constantly seeing this picture of Aeneas as dutiful um, at many, many different points um, in Aeneid Book 2. Uh, you know, we see him rushing off to the palace, for example, to protect Priam and the other Trojans there. Uh, you know, we see Aeneas kind of, um, you know, protecting the Trojan refugees, kind of hiding them um, at the mound of Ceres, um, in, in, you know, in, in the sh shelter of that, of that hill. We see him then going back for his wife, Creusa. So Virgil is constantly reminding us what a good guy Aeneas is, whereas Ovid is completely turning that on his head and turning Aeneas into the faithless betrayer of Dido. So I think, so that's the crucial contrast to keep in mind when you're reading back over this um, poem.